Emerging markets are growing at an astonishing rate, and business is an important engine for growth in many corners of the world. Leading corporations and governments alike are seeking to foster economic growth while also fueling their own business pipelines through investment and infrastructure expansion. If you're tuning in online today, by the way, we hope you're also joining the conversation on, at Twitter at Pound Catalyze 14. We're excited to have Amon Singh, the editorial director of CSR Wire, moderating our online conversation for the first part of our broadcast. Now, here on stage, I'm kicking off today's events with Paul Trigig Trigido. I, pr I promised you beforehand I'd try to say it right. I almost did. Uh, but Paul is vice chair and managing director of debt capital markets at Credit Suisse. Welcome. Thank you, Nina. Bo Miller, Global Director of Corporate Citizenship at Dow and President of the Dow Chemical Company Foundation, and Elizabeth Littlefield, President and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Today, we're talking about how industry and investment can pave the way for market growth. So, Paul, what are the most compelling invis investments in these markets that you're seeing? Thank you, Nina, and good afternoon to you. Well, the good news is that the menu of compelling investments is both vibrant and active, and there is a large pipeline of compelling investments. The challenge and perhaps the opportunity is that menu's diversity and its range. But it might be worth, if I may, just taking one step back to focus on the words investments and indeed the word investors, particularly in light of the opening comments that I uh, just had the pleasure of hearing because the actors, the investors in this space are very, very, very diverse indeed. From philanthropy on the one side, all the way through to venture capital on the other side, or I should say the other end of the spectrum, and everything in between. Now, although the interaction between those constituencies is vitally important, it is perhaps another question for another time to discuss, what is clear that the common denominator of that diverse range of investors is intent. Intent to make a social impact, intent to make an impact with the base of the pyramid. Around that intent, and I'll come to some specific examples in one minute, I think there are two themes that I would extract from that diverse group of investors. One theme is that investment has to deliver sustainable scale. Within the context of sustainability, I would include self-financing at some point on the horizon. Scale speaks for itself and inevitably leads to discussion about the impact of technology on the ability to ramp up and ramp up quickly. The other theme that I think unites this diverse group, uh, group of actors is focusing on, let's call them the client and that is the client needs. Not what we think the client should or might want to demand, but actually what the client needs. And that client can be defined by geography, it can be defined by sector, it can be defined by demogra 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 demographics. And taking those themes, let me just take a moment to highlight four specific instances of where I see great and compelling investment opportunities, and perhaps starting off at the patient capital end of the spectrum, where, for instance, an organization has devoted substantial time, more than 10 years, to focusing on the fact that at the base of the, uh, of, of the pyramid, women are such a crucial factor for economic development. And one of the biggest impacts on the ability of women to be that catalyst is the absence or presence of some form of health insurance, it being the case that a major health, health event can stop that economic catalyst. So, in this business model that I'm thinking about, the provision to women at the base of the pyramid of medical services insurance, including pregnancy, by the way, throughout of the lifetime of a woman is seen as an amazing catalyst to growth with direct economic impact. Then you take, you're staying in a geographical segment in Kenya, for instance, where the ability of farm owners to acquire, uh, to acquire livestock in terms of a capital outlay is constrained. 
provision of micro leasing services to enable the cow, the goat, or the farming equipment to be leased, thereby cutting back on the restriction of having to give security in many of these cases, has provoked a, a sustainable business model that will expand. But these are 10-year business models. I can't conclude a discussion about impactful business models without talking about technology. The iconic M-Pesa model, whereby mobile phone technology is taken and delivered financial services to those who would not have the opportunity, is well known. Perhaps not so well known is the use of the rails created by those opportunities for other services, microinsurance, education. What better point of impact to start financial education than when somebody is actually executing a transaction? And last, if we turn to the area of big data, social media, the way in which data, be it from phones, your Facebook account, or indeed other forms of social media, can be analyzed, your usage, to deliver risk profiles that particularly on so-called thin file clients so that financial institutions can come to safer, better, quicker, cheaper credit decisions about where to extend credit has created tremendous opportunities both on a global scale and in terms of impact. What is the corporate self-interest in all this? The corporate self-interest? The corporate self-interest is really very simple. It's sustainability. Because in the context of any corporation's life, sustainability is absolutely embedded in our client's sustainability, our business's sustainability. And when we think, pick your number, 4 billion people at the base of the pyramid, 2 billion people at the base of the pyramid, with a economic purchasing power of infinitely more opportunity than courtesy of technology than we have witnessed, the ability to work with, leverage and deliver means that sustainable invest, a sustainable corporation is, is absolutely key to developing a long-term approach. And by the way, and this is perhaps for others to comment, the ability to deliver a service and an, and an engagement that our employees, unless we deliver it, will go and find somewhere else. So, Paul, I wanted you to talk about your own path that, that you've traveled in your corporate citizenship journey that led you to focus on social entrepreneurism um, and offering these broad, sustainable solutions. But I also wanted to ask you, internally in companies, where is that conversation? I mean, clearly, it, it you know has has that that conversation in and of itself has had to take a journey. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you, Nina, and thank you to Pixera for bringing us together for this conversation. Yeah. It's an important one. <clears throat> I think the Dow journey. Uh, in many ways, started with our founder 117 years ago. Uh, he was an entrepreneur and actually came in and out of business several times before he found success. But in the modern era, I think our, our view of this probably began in the early 1990s, right after the, uh, the UN Summit on Sustainable Development in Rio. And uh, we went forward and we appointed an external advisory council, um, thought leaders from around the globe, uh, focused on corporate responsibility and on, on sustainability outside of our board of directors, but a, a, another advisory council altogether who really provoked our thinking uh, to, to think more broadly and deeply about these subjects, uh, which led to um, a, our first set of 10-year goals, what I call our, our kind of our uh, uh, footprint kind of goals. These were goals that um, were really focused on the environment and environmental sustainability, uh, reducing our impacts uh, on the environment. And these were big breakthrough goals. We had goals that were focused on uh, energy efficiency. Uh, we had greenhouse gas goals back in the, in the early 90 kind of time frame, which are very you know, pertinent today. We invested about a billion dollars to e execute these goals. And depending on how you account for energy, uh, we put about $9 billion to the bottom line as a result of those. So the business case for thinking in, this, in these terms you know, was well established quite some time ago within mm -hmm. the company. In 20, uh, 2005, we set our next 10 year of goals, what we called our uh, 2015 sustainability goals. We're in the process of wrapping those up, you know, currently over the next 18 months or so. And those were much more what I would call handprint goals uh, and, and goals that were really focused on, uh, to your comment about the, the population, uh, we're 6 billion on the planet today, growing to 9 billion. So food and water and energy and uh, affordable housing and health care, I mean, these are critical big global issues and concerns. And so, these sets of goals were really focused on 
uh, how do we use our capabilities, not just our products, but our technologies, our capabilities as a company, our employees, to really ad address and, and have breakthroughs in those big fields of, of need for the world? And that's where we really started thinking about social entrepreneurs, um, because we do see them as the, the key to rise, raising people out of poverty. Uh, we do see them as uh, the key to developing economies. Um, and so it was through that we made actually a, a venture capital investment in a uh, company in India that was uh, providing um, small uh, community-based water systems in rural India. And we did that even though we had a very large uh, scale desalination business and, and other kinds of membrane technologies for filtering. Those were businesses that were at the global scale, the industrial scale. And this was just a very small uh, social entrepreneur, but it gave us a, a real-time market research project. It allowed us to be in the market to understand what this business mm -hmm. like, looked like 15 years from now and, uh, and kind of learn by doing, if you will. And so that was kind of our first foray into social entrepreneurism. Then we saw through that um, series of interchanges the opportunity to uh, employ, uh, deploy, I should say, our employees to use their professional skills, their problem solving skills, their technology skills, uh, to help scale social entrepreneurs. And, and that is a path that we've been on for the last four or five years and where we got involved with Pixera. And I think really one that I see many other corporations moving towards. So how do you use the professional skills of your employees to help scale uh, social entrepreneurs and develop economies? And so Give us a very granular sure. sense of how that works, mm -hmm. scaling those entrepreneurs. And what's the toughest part of that? What's been, what's been the hardest thing to overcome? Uh, well, probably the, the hardest thing to overcome is it's, it's development, it's business development. It's just like any, even if we're in our labs in an yeah. established geography, we have failures. Uh, um, we run a lot of experiments before we get to you know, the right answer. And it's really no different in, in some of these spaces. It's so you have just, to be willing to fail is what uh, you're you saying. Fail fast, learn from it, and, and, and continue on. So that's, that's kind of just a common theme. And there are other kind of cultural issues and other kinds of things you have to be aware of. You've got to, you, know, you can't solve some of these problems sitting in a, in a conference room in, in, in the Midwest. Huh? You've got to right. be on the ground. You've got to be in there personally understanding and absorbing and got to be committed uh, in, in many different ways. And, and being physically present there, I think, is a big part of it. Uh, but to, to give you an example of how some of these things uh, may transpire, one of our very first uh, projects in this space um, came to us from a startup company in Nairobi. Uh, they had discovered that a local plant, the Art of Medicine plant, had a particular protein that had anti-malarial properties to it, and they were mm -hmm. trying to scale this business. And they understood the market opportunity because they had a, a large pharma company on, on the other end willing to take this I ingredient, and they, they understood the, uh, the financial kind of challenges they had, but they didn't have a good grip on the technical challenges. So uh, one of their investors, uh, Acumen Fund, came to us and said, you happen to have anybody in your labs that knows anything about protein extraction and purification? And we yeah. said, which of these 400 folks do you want right, to talk exactly. to? Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, so in fact, that led to a project where one of our um, uh, employees, uh, uh, a woman with 25 years of experience of this exact thing, uh, was deployed to study the technology for about a month at our labs uh, in our headquarters location. She then went to the pilot plant in Nairobi and spent a month there working with the engineers and the staff and the researchers of this, of this company. And then came back to our laboratories and spent about another three or four weeks doing uh, bench trials and tests and delivered back to the investors and to the company um, what we call a technical assessment package. It was, you know, if you invest this kind of technology, you're going to get these kinds of purities and yields and so on. And if you go this route, it's a little lower on the capital, but you get different yields rates. And it was the kind of thing mm -hmm. that they were looking to you know, to, to, to make yeah. their decisions on. And it might, have, it might have taken them months, if not years, to get that to that information level. And we were able to turn that around in about three months. So that's maybe And a, what a, is it? Describe the company now. It's, it's still growing. It's yeah. developing. Um, and, uh, and it's, it, it, but it's, like I said at the outset, it's development. So they've had some other fits and starts along the way, um, infrastructure and other kinds of things. But it's, it's moving in a, in a path that uh, we're pleased to have had a small part in. So before I get to Elizabeth, and I will, I w just both of you, if you, what advice would you give to a Fortune 1000 company that wanted to go down this route of, of investing in sustainable communities in emerging markets? What it, give us three pieces of advice. Uh, two pop to my mind. Um, I'll come up with a third, but the first two. The first is be humble and be authentic. Uh, humble being the, in these emerging geographies, you're going to places 
um, where you really need to understand the culture, the conditions, the, the history, um, the values. And, uh, and again, you don't get that in a boardroom in the Midwest. Uh, you have to really experience that. So I think be humble. And then when I say authentic, I mean, you know, bring your, bring your, per, your cap capabilities and, and capacity as a company. Bring authentic skills and resources and, and uh, things that you have deep wells of knowledge in. Don't, you know, because you, you're really being a critical part of their success. Mm -hmm. So be authentic in your approach. May I, may I add possibly the yes. third, which is be patient. Yes. This is a process. And anybody looking for quick wins has probably found the wrong thing. Hmm. And that works better in some cultures than others. But, but without patience, it is too easy to regard these problems, which are by definition messy, chaotic, and intractable at the outset. The other, the other aspect I would, uh, from, from our own experience, is embrace the entire employee base. Mm -hmm. I have not seen at Credit Suisse our global citizenship programs, our advocacy groups around microfinance and sustainability are probably the most inclusive organizations that we have, defined by any metric, front office, back office, age, gender, ability. Everybody gets involved. We have 40,000 employees. Systems don't always encourage that cross-cultural, yeah. cross-divisional involvement. I'm delighted to say at Credit Suisse that that's a priority, but it's a prize that's hard fought for and hard won. And do they work in that segment of the company, or is there a flow back and forth between operations and the, this? The, the list of their specialities, be it operations, be it business generation, be it IT, be it credit, being risk, me risk me measurement, crosses every boundary that we have, and it does it very well. Interesting. So Elizabeth, OPIC invests in businesses overseas in part to drive growth in the US. Mm -hmm. um, why is investing in emerging markets important to American economic stability? Well, thanks, Nina, very much. I really, uh, I, I wanted to thank, start, start by thanking Purexa for hosting this event today. It's a fabulous conversation to be part of. And I was reflecting back, actually, I got my start in, a, in my career in emerging markets, now, now at OPIC, uh, in volunteering, in effect. I, I spent two years on leave of absence from J.P. Morgan, first ever leave of absence the firm granted uh, in emerging markets in, in Africa, working on microfinance back then. So I'm a big believer in the whole notion of corporate volunteerism, having started there myself and having you know, that launched sort of 30 years. I've been now working, kicking around these markets, making my fair share of mistakes and stubbing my toe on partnerships gone awry. So, but it's been interesting because at that time, you know, if you were going to work in emerging markets and in sustainability, but also have a day job, you were kind of split, in, your brain was split in half. Yeah. And I find now it's been very exciting to be at OPIC where all of the values of, of development and sustainability do come together with the values of you know, corporate, you know, making, making, you know, making profits and, and engaging sustainably. So, um, as you mentioned, OPIC is, so it's the U.S. government's development finance institution, and our job is really to catalyze just the very flows that we're talking about, the capital flows into emerging markets that are going to be sort of the bedrock of the U.S.'s connection and relationship with, with those markets. Um, and what I would would say in, in response directly to your question is that I think we're founded on two very connected beliefs. Um, one is that the private sector business is one of the most powerful forces for development uh, in the in the globe right now, and it's and the emphasis is shifting more and more towards business as a force for good in these markets, and away from simply foreign aid being the way we we interact with these countries. So one belief is business as a force of good and the growing role of the private sector uh, in developed development. And the second um, belief is that um, actually when you bring businesses and businesses together, American businesses and those in emerging markets, people to people relationships, this is the most powerful way we have for creating the kind of partnerships that are gonna create lasting uh, and positive relationships between ourselves and our partner countries. Partners, partnerships that are founded on mutual prosperity, mutual respect, exchange of innovation and technology, and a lasting notion that we should both be prospering together. So I think when you, when you think about the role of business, I think it's critical to see that, mute, that commonality of interests 
and how critical these are to our very foreign policy needs. You know, today, as you might have seen in the papers, uh, today's in Rwanda is commemorating the 20th anniversary of the genocide there. And I had the privilege on this leave of absence in my first experience in, in, uh, in corporate volunteerism, uh, the experience of working in Rwanda 20 years ago, just before the genocide, and was just back there two weeks ago. And it's incredible to see how much the US is appreciated Mm. and respected and how much our investment is really what that country wants. Mm. Not so much the aid, not so much anything else. They really want the investments. And, you know, when I look at some of the work that OPEC is doing in that country, we're, you know, financing an American company that's investing in tea plantations, employing uh, Rwandans in that country and providing the highest standards of, you know, employee and labor relations that you could ever want, uh, financing coffee pr processing, financing some agricultural projects. These are all things that OPEC has financed, but they really do embody the whole value of America's engagement in emerging markets being typified by empathy, mutual partnership, understanding, and, and respect that I think is really the bedrock of peace and prosperity and mutual you know, sustainability for the long run. You know, as somebody who's been so steeped in this for decades, um, let me ask you this. I mean, what, if foreign aid, I don't have to tell you there's been mixed results. There's a, there's a lot of um, people who've been very critical of it. What mistakes did public aid, public assistance make that a business going down this road should learn from? Well, I think some of the things that were mentioned earlier are, are critically important. You know, being patient, uh, focusing on the long run, and, and really having, I think, a cultural sensitivity as well is, is critical. But, you know, let's remember that foreign aid is called upon to do things that nobody else has been able to figure out. Right. So it's liable to have, you know, bigger challenges than business comes. Business, you know, hopefully OPEC leads business, but business right. follows, you know, into markets that have been made secure and stable uh, by the great work of not only our Defense Department, but also, you know, our foreign aid work. Uh, so I think, you know, when I look at the work that, that OPEC is doing in Afghanistan, in large part, you know, one of our objectives is to follow in the footsteps of the military and follow in the footsteps of the aid community by helping bring private capital in to invest in ways that are going to create sustainable jobs and the beginnings of a fledgling private market that can outlast, you know, the short term and time bound you know, flows that come from, from defense. And, and Afghanistan uh, is such a good example. I'm glad you brought that up, transitioning to this next set of questions, which is instability, which is, is on the rise, as we know right now in Afghanistan, corruption, um, lack of a rule of law in a lot of emerging markets. Uh, what, how do you cope with that? What are the lessons? Well, fortunately, uh, my agency now has a 40-year history of really choosing the right projects and working with the projects to structure deals that are going to work in really difficult frontier markets. And I'm you know, very proud to say that we've been returning money to the taxpayer consistently for 35 straight years, mm. meaning that the teams at OPEC really know how to do this right, how to support businesses investing in these markets, but do so in a way that's viable, that's commercial, that's, and that, that, that is, uh, is sustainable. When you talk about corruption in these markets, it's clear. It, first of all, it's, it's one has to remember that there's corruptors and there's corruptees. Hmm. And so everyone's in the game when there's corruption. Hmm. It's not just the recipient. Uh, but also we work with the private sector, and we're extremely careful about our partnerships and have therefore, you know, knock on wood, you know, had a very, very good experience. But people need to know that in fresh markets where democracy is new, where it may be just post-conflict, where there's still ethnic tensions going on, these are difficult markets. Policy environments are unstable and shifting. The sands can change. Tensions are under, underlying a lot of the relationships. So I think a lot of the things that have been said are critically important to really being clear-eyed. I would add the word empathy okay. uh, and, and patient and co cognizant of, 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 of cultural sensitivities in, in investing in these markets. Did you have no, I was just going to echo that. I mean, I could, re I could relate to the many things you're saying about about that uh, need to really be um, uh, empathetic in, in, in your approach and understanding and build. And I think maybe some of these things need to start at a small scale, get a base established, yeah. get, 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 get some confidence uh, amongst all the participants, and then, then you can expand and build from there. I don't, that one has to be a big bang. It can, it can actually you know, yeah. move from, a, from a, 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 a solid foundation that's established over time.
You know, you were talking about public-private yeah, partnerships earlier on, and I find that's one of those terms that I always find a little confusing because I think people use it. Not that you didn't use it absolutely <laughs> accurately, but they, they use it, and it means different things to different people. Sure. So I find the whole notion of partnership can be so kind of dangerous because I find oftentimes people mean different things when they come into a partnership. And one of the biggest challenges to making those partnerships work is clarity of expectations at the outset. Hmm. Um, because sometimes people say, let's partner on this or that thing. And sometimes the one person means, well, why don't you give me money to do the thing I want to do? <laughs> oh, interesting. And yeah. the other person yeah. thinks, well, maybe I should partner with you right. to ask you to go do something I wanted to do. So right. sometimes I find the word choice is critically important and clarifying expectations I up front is key. I, th I think the word clarity is yeah. very, very important here. As we said at the beginning, there are many, many actors in here, and we've covered a range of issues from philanthropic to NGOs to venture capital, and the ability for those actors to do what they do in accordance with those missions, with their own missions, yet, if they don't partner, be related, be integrated, so there's a natural continuum for philanthropy through to the ability of the private sector to impact mm. is key to this, and it's one of the hardest things, one of the hardest things to do. But there are so many issues that this industry faces around its infrastructure. You look at microfinance, developed very, very rapidly, as Elizabeth well knows, she was there at the beginning. And now we look at some major issues that, that can and must be sold by infrastructure, which only, you might hesitate to use the words not-for-profit, but very patient funds can solve. Whereas charging ahead on the technology sector, there's some clear for-profit opportunities, all of which make social impact. But the integration of these actors at the same time as focusing on their specific contributions, and I think we as corporations have a very major role to play in that as well. So we're out of time, but before you go, I want, I want to go down to each of you and, and leave us with one lesson that companies still haven't learned. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Go ahead. Um, so on, on that, I think in linking that back to Pixar and, the, and the, the conversation today, I think one of the critical things that we're seeing is finally corporations are learning that sustainability is not just about operational risk and protecting corporations from what might go wrong, but about understanding that at the very core of the business model, sustainable principles can drive profitability over the long run. But the thing I think companies have not uh, figured out, well, with, of, of course, with the present company accepted, um, <laughs> is that actually what's driving this is not really so, it's risk, yes, but it's people. Because employees care yeah. about the value proposition that their companies are offering them in terms of sustainability and purpose. Hmm. And, you, and customers care hmm. about companies' sustainability and purpose. And I think more and more over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we're going to find both employees and customers caring more and more and more about these things and not less and less and less. So it's companies that get that sustainability is about core values and business models and supply chains, to me, are the ones that are going to win. Interesting. And briefly, Bo and Paul? I, I, I echo that. But uh, I would say something we're, maybe in, we haven't yet to learn, but we're, ju we're just learning we need to accelerate is the development of what I call social entrepreneurs. That mm -hmm. is allowing folks within a large organization, a large company like Dow, uh, to have, who have access to all the skills and resources and the capacity of the company um, who can scale things quickly to, to allow room for social entrepreneurs to operate within our business units. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, and some of that's being done, but I think that's a lesson that we're l just learning. Okay. I couldn't agree with you more. The transition of corporate and social responsibility to a business case needs to be sharper, more focused, and demand a lot more attention. And I come across it time and time again. I think we're getting it. We're getting it slowly. Be patient with us as well, please, <laughs> because we do get it. And I, if I just one last anecdote, um, uh, a couple of recent graduates from fine schools with fine degrees, more than a couple, come up to up, me in my personal capacity, to corporations in their formal capacity, and say, tell me about a career path in CSR. Hmm. Yeah. And you know what? That's a very, very difficult question to answer, and it shouldn't be. Excellent. Thank you, all three of you, so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you.